The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Strong themes and coarse language may apply. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. Once again, our 2015 Sonic Summerstock Playhouse brings you classic theatre, adapted and performed by some of the very best audio players from around the world. I'm David Alt, and with Jack Ward, we are your hosts. Welcome to the Playhouse. Welcome to Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. I'm Jack Ward for David Alt, who has just about moved into his new place, The Lucky Devil. I wish I was there seeing the place, but who knows? There's talk of an audio drama meetup in England next year, and I think it would be a fantastic time to get to meet in person again. I mean, you know, after all our adventures in time and space the last couple of years. But you know, speaking of adventures, before tonight's show, I have the latest journey that Ginny, my wife, and I have taken for the last just about six months now with our good friend and writer and Kung Fu Action Theater creator, Rob Patterson. And this is what we've done. As you know, I'm a passionate advocate for writing, and I was thinking that there is no one place for all the people who put together ebooks to gather. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so let's imagine you're someone who has written your first novel and you want to get it published, where do you go to find an editor that could read your manuscript and give you a professional editing job, I mean, other than a publishing house? And they won't take it until they know that they're actually publishing it. So with so many brick and mortar places closing up shop, wouldn't it be great to connect with a professional book editor to go through and fix your novel for you? I mean, it could cost you up to $2,000 to get the right one to do so, but once it's done, you can be confident not only that it could be published, but it will be more likely than ever to draw an audience because it's more clearly written. So let's say you're done the editing and now you need someone to format your opus into an ebook. Well, there's lots of formats and not everybody has the skills to set up your ebook for a Kindle or a Mobi or EPUB or even a PDF. You could struggle with figuring out how to set the keywords and meta tags or, or you could get someone to do it all for you. Someone who's done this a thousand times and can give you the best price. But we're not done there. Before you set up your ebook format, you're going to need great book cover art. Where will you find someone who can make your book pop out from all those others in the Amazon store? Someone who can grab your ideas and present it graphically. So you've got a team of people working for you at bookcraft.org. And of course, the services don't stop there. Got a great idea for a book, but you can't write? Well, hire a ghostwriter. No idea how to market your book when it's done? Hire a marketer. Maybe you want to release your ebook as an audiobook. Hire a narrator from one of the actors listed. Or maybe even an audio editor. Heck, so many books that make video trailers on YouTube are getting a huge response. If you got the money, hire somebody who knows how to create these trailers and get it done right. And there's, there's many more options. It doesn't have to be a novel. Why not an essay or a movie script or a stage play or a short story or a poem? Our hope was to have a single home, a single marketplace for people who love writing and creating as much as we do. A place where professionals come together and get the opportunity to work from home doing what they love. The very thought that bookcraft.org could make people's dreams of writing come true, whether it gets them e-published or into bookstores all around the world, it really, it really makes me excited. And so that's our dream. And we spent months building the website to make it happen. Our bookcraft.org is open and ready to go. All we need is you. 
If you're a graphics artist, a voice actor, an audio or video engineer, a book setter, a marketing guru, a legal professional for books, a writer, whatever your skills for producing books of all kinds, we want you. It doesn't cost anything to make an account, but what an account does is it gives you the opportunity to make a free ad, which effectively hangs a shingle out on bookcraft.org, telling people you can work for them to make their dream come true. What a free account does mean is that you can contact these professionals and get them to help make your dream come true. When you're making an ad or providing a service, as we like to call it, you're the boss. You decide what your price will be. You decide whether you're going to accept a job or not. When you're a member of bookcraft.org shopping around for the best skills, you get the opportunity to pick any of the people who are offering services and give them the information through internal emails as to what you want. You begin a kind of paid partnership. Here's an example. Let's say I'm Matt, the graphics designer. I have a full-time job. I love making graphics on the side. I do so for friends and family, but would love to make money doing it too. I sign up to bookcraft.org and post a new service. In my post, I tell people what I'm offering black and white pencil graphics for your novel, for example. I decide that I can draw in pencils a basic character of a small scene for, let's say, $75. I put up a picture with a graphic to show people what I can do and wait for someone to answer my ad. Teresa uh, maybe writes amazing horror novels and audio dramas. She wants someone to draw some old-fashioned H.P. Lovecraft-style depictions of her ancient demons. She clicks on Matt's ad and strikes up a conversation telling Matt exactly what he wants. She even uploads a crude drawing and sends him a URL of something of the kind of beast he's looking for. Matt tells her how much that will cost. Teresa agrees, and they set a timeline. Matt might outline the graphic. Teresa might want some small changes. They agree on the look from some back and forth discussions, and Matt finishes the graphic. Teresa sends him the money via secure PayPal account, and Teresa is so thrilled that she gives Matt full review and five stars. You see, the number of reviews someone gets affects their ranking in the list. So there's a real desire to have the best interaction between craftspeople who do the services and those who are trying to buy them. But hey, you know, in another time, maybe Matt is contacted by Teresa and he's so busy he doesn't have the time to do the job or, or the style is in his forte. So he declines the job and wishes her well and Teresa goes looking through the graphics section of bookcraft.org for another artist. Matt can draw securely his money from his work or leave it in the bookcraft.org securely to draw out at the end of the week or by monthly or at the end of the year, whenever is best for him. So this is why bookcraft.org is the best marketplace for getting writers and all the tradespeople together to build more stories. Uh, we've done all the work, but the one thing we can't do is populate it. Like any other marketplace, we need people to go in and set up shop. So every Matt out there, go create a service for graphics. Every Gwendolyn, go out and make a service for your audio acting and narration. Every Fiona, go out and make a service for your editing. Every Mike, go out and, and make a service for your audio engineering work. Every Edith, go out and create a service for your novel editing. And, and here's why. We're exactly four months away from NaNoWriMo, the world's largest novel push. More than a quarter million people sign up for NaNoWriMo each year. If only 10% of them are anxious to get their books ready for publication at the end of November, that's 25,000 requests for work. Makes for a nice little Christmas bonus, wouldn't it? <laughs> and that's just one event each year. Okay. One more thing before I finish. You're saying, okay, Jack, what's the catch? You're not making nothing out of this. And you're right. I mean, the amount of work we put in, the time and the effort and the server costs we pay monthly out of pocket just to keep bookcraft.org isn't paid with just good intentions. So for every job paid on bookcraft.org, 10% goes back to us. We're hoping that that will help pay back the costs and go to continually building and upgrading the system and building things like mobile apps to help measure and count your active services. 
Other sites take 30% off the top. But considering that the prices for book craft services could be widely varied, I just want people to find the best fit and to keep the site afloat. I think together we can do that. What have you got to lose? Free secure accounts, free ads for services, no obligations to accept any kind of offers you don't want to, and you get to rate all services you use and take out your earnings whenever you like. That's bookcraft.org. Bookcraft.org. Are you excited? I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really, really excited. And, and this month, I'm going to try to make some videos to show people how easy it is to make their own service ads and accounts. But I'd really like people to sign up. Like, right now, I think I'm the only one. <laughs> so get in now Well, there's a few folks. Build up your rep so that there's a lot of work. I mean, you're the person they could want to go to if you're the first ones there. Wouldn't you want to make some money doing what you love from home? I know I would. Try it out. Bookcraft.org. Okay, we don't normally advertise in the Sonic Society, and this doesn't signal a change that we will. But I hope you'll understand that this is a huge project for us, and, and we want everyone to get involved because it helps us all. I shake with excitement when I think of all the stories yet to be published that I get to read. Please let me be a part of yours. Tonight on Sonic Summerstock Playhouse, I am thrilled to give you a great oversized exclusive one night performance from our friends at Pulpery Theater. The Narada Radio Players and Pete Lutz present Orson Welles' Lux Theater's adaptation of The Third Man. So enough of the preamble. On with the show. And thanks for listening. Tonight as a very special presentation in the Sonic Society's Summer Stock Series for 2015. The Narada Radio Company presents a remake of The Third Man, first presented on the Columbia Broadcasting System's Lux Radio Theater on April 9, 1951, and based on the 1949 film of the same name. Directed by Carol Reed, it starred Joseph Cotton as Holly Martins and Orson Welles as Harry Lyme. The Lux Radio Theater brought Cotton and Wells back together again in front of the microphone to reprise their original roles. And tonight, we feature Alan Clower in the Holly Martin's role and Pete Lutz as Harry Lyme. In keeping with the spirit of this remake, you will hear other celebrity names mentioned, as well as the original commercials for the Lux products that sponsored this series for more than 20 years. However, they are presented in a historical context only and are not to be considered sponsors of this remake. And now, without further ado, the Narada Radio Company takes great pleasure in presenting the Lux Radio Theater. Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles in The Third Man. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In tonight's play, The Third Man, we have a perfect setting for a murder mystery. Post-war Europe filled with spies, intrigue, and black markets. Into this atmosphere of cunning and subterfuge comes an American to take up the trail of the unknown murderer of his friend. A trail that leads him into hazardous and chilling adventure. As the stars of this suspenseful David O. Selznick production, we have in their original roles two of the finest actors of screen and radio, Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles. The Third Man not only has a plot to hold everyone's interest, but one of the most haunting of musical themes played on a most unusual instrument, the zither. 
Now that spring is here, it won't be long before we hear another unforgettable theme as Lux lovely girls everywhere begin their wedding march. And women who give their complexions daily Lux toilet soap care will, of course, be among the loveliest of brides. the curtain rises on The Third Man, starring Joseph Cotton as Holly Martins and Orson Welles as Harry Lyme. I never knew the old Vienna before the war, with its Strauss music, its glamour and easy charm. Constantinople suited me better. I really got to know it in the classic period of the black market. We'd run anything if people wanted it enough and had the money to pay. Now the city of Vienna is divided into four zones, you know, each occupied by a power, American, British, Russian, and French. But the center of the city, that's international, policed by an international patrol, one member of each of the four powers. Wonderful, what a hope they had. All strangers to the place, and none of them could speak the same language except, of course, a smattering of German. Good fellows on the whole, did their best, you know. Vienna doesn't really look any worse than a lot of other European cities. Bombed about a bit. Oh, oh, I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you about Holly Martins, an American. Came all the way here to visit a friend of his. The name was Lyme, Harry Lyme. Martins was broke, you see, and Lyme had offered him some sort, I don't know, some sort of job. Anyway, there he was, poor chap, didn't know Lyme had been killed, and then had to go to Lyme's funeral, and Martins without a cent. When the funeral was over, I left the cemetery with a British officer, a Major Calloway. He offered to drive me back into town. Then he said he thought I needed a drink. The Major was right. There you are. Yes, you've had a bit of a shock, Mr. Martins. You say you arrived in Vienna only this morning? <sighs> Just in time to go to the funeral. You, uh, you came to Vienna to attend the funeral? Came here to go to work. A friend of mine offered me a job, publicity work, for some kind of charity he was running. Well, my friend's dead. Harry Lyme offered you a job? Best friend I ever had. You're a writer, you said. Did you ever hear of the Lone Rider of Santa Fe? Death at the Double X Ranch? Mm, can't say that I have. Well, I'm not surprised. So anyway, don't get any ideas about money. I'm broke. Harry even sent me an airplane ticket. No money at all? A little. Not very much. Where are you staying? Was going to stay with him. It was the porter at his apartment house who told me... Told you what, Mr. Martins? About the accident. Harry had been killed. He didn't have many friends, did he? I mean, well, at the cemetery, for instance, a handful of people. Who were they? Did you know them? I know who they are, yes. A, a, a Dr. Winkle, Baron Kurtz, a, a girl named Anna Schmidt. Oh, what a waste. It's a shame. What? Him dying like that. Best thing that's ever happened to him. What are you trying to say? He was about the worst racketeer who ever made a dirty living in this city. So that's what you are, a policeman. This is the international zone. Your country, too, has military police here. So do the French and the Russians. We try to work together. Pin it on a dead man. Some petty racket with gasoline or something. Just like a cop. It wasn't petrol. So it wasn't petrol. So it was tires or saccharin. Why don't you catch a few murderers for a change? Well, you could say that murder was part of Harry Lyme's racket. Why, you... That's quite sufficient, Sergeant Payne. I don't think you'll try to punch me again. Will you, Mr. Martins? Uh... Sergeant Payne? Yes, sir. Drive Mr. Martins to Sacco's Hotel. Very good, sir. Nothing elegant, Mr. Martins. Military personnel mostly, but... Now, just a minute, Callahan. Callaway. I'm English, not Irish. You're not going to close your files at a dead man's expense. Going to find me the real criminal? 
It sounds like one of your stories. When I've finished with you, you'll leave Vienna. You'll look so silly. You said you had very little cash. Here's some army money. Should see you through tonight at the hotel. If you don't drink too much at the bar, we'll keep a seat for you on tomorrow's plane. All right, Sergeant. Take him to Sackers. Don't hit him again if he behaves. <laughs> They gave me a room on the second floor. I had hardly shut the door when the telephone rang. Hello? Mr. Martins? Who's this? Baron Kurtz. Who? I was a friend of Harry Lyme. I would very much like to meet you, Baron. Come around... Austrians aren't allowed in your hotel. Couldn't we meet at the Mozart Cafe? Where? Just around the corner. How will I know you? I'll carry a copy of one of your books. Uh, Harry gave it to me. The, uh, the Oklahoma Kid? I'll be right over. Thank you, Mr. Martins. Uh, Mr. Martins, delighted to meet you. What would you like? Uh, tea? Coffee? Coffee, please. Black. Zwei Zwarze. It's wonderful how you keep the tension. Tension? Uh, the suspense. In this book, I mean. Oh, so you were a friend of Harry's? I think his best, uh, except for you, of course. The police have a crazy notion that he was mixed up in some sort of racket. Everyone in Vienna is. We all sell cigarettes and that kind of thing. I tell you, I've done things that would have seemed unsinkable before the war. Once, when I was hard up, I sold some tires on the black market. <laughs> I wonder what my father would have said. I'm afraid the police meant more than that. They get rather absurd ideas sometimes. Poor Harry. Where he is now, he won't mind about that. Even so, I'm not going to leave it at this. Will you help me? I wish I could, but you know I am an Austrian. I have to be careful with the police. I'm afraid I can't help you, except with advice, of course. Advice. I want to know how he was killed. With a truck. He was struck by the truck. Y yeah, I mean, how did it happen? We will drink our coffee, Mr. Martins. It is not far from here, where it happened. We will walk there and I will show you. We came out of his place there, where the porter is sleeping, and we were walking towards the corner. A friend of his called to him from over there. That square across the street? Exactly. Harry stepped off the curb, and from up there came the truck. That quickly? Yes. His friend and I picked him up, carried him across over here. It was a terrible thing, terrible. We laid him down just about here, and this is where he died. Even at the end, his thoughts were of you. What did he say? I don't remember the words, Holly. I may call you Holly, mayn't I? He always called you that to us. He was anxious that I look after you when you arrived to see that you got safely home. Tickets, you know, and all that. But the porter said he died instantaneously. Well, he died before the ambulance could reach us. So there was only you and this friend of his. Who is he? A Romanian, Mr. Popesco. I'd like to talk to him. He's left Vienna. Oh, excuse me, I want to ask the porter something. Or you? Did you know Mr. Lyme well? Mr. Lyme? Yes. You remember me this morning. I was here? Y yes, I, I remember you. Well, who used to visit Mr. Lyme? Visit? Was er er wissen? Er will wissen, wer hier verkehrt. So es kommen so viele Leute hier, sie der Popescoot und ich kann nicht alle kennen. What does he say? He says he doesn't know everybody. Karl, kannst du einen Moment zu mir hereinkommen? Ein Moment. Du musst zum Telefon. Please, excuse me. Um, Baron Kurtz. Who was at the funeral besides you? You saw them, only his physician, Dr. Winkle, and the British officer, Major Calloway. Wasn't there a girl there? Some girl of the Josefstadt Theater. Well, you know what Harry was. You oughtn't to speak to her. It would only cause her pain. Not necessarily. 
she'd probably want to help. What's the good of another post-mortem? Suppose you dig up something, well, <clears throat> discreditable to Harry. Will you give me your address? I live in the Russian sector, but you'll find me at the Casanova Club every night. One has to work the best way one can, you know. What's the name of this girl? I don't know. I don't think I ever heard it. But you did mention the theater. The Yoshevstadt. But I still think it won't do Harry any good. You'd do better to think of yourself. <laughs> I'll be all right. Of course. I'm so glad to have met you. A master of suspense. <laughs> this book, such a good cover, I think. Mr. Martins, isn't it? Mm. My key, number eight, please. Yes, sir. Oh, how can I get a ticket for the Joseph Stott Theater for tonight? I think we can arrange that. Speaking of tickets, sir, mm -hmm. Major Calloway's compliments, sir. Here is the ticket for the plane tomorrow. Tell the Major I won't need it. I've decided to stay for a while. Oh. Yeah. Yes, yes, Mr. Martins. I'll tell him. That night, I went to the Joseph Stott Theater. After the performance, a pack of cigarettes got me past the doorman to Anna Schmidt's dressing room. Holly Martins? That name is supposed to mean something to me? I thought perhaps Harry told you about it. No, me. he never told me about his friends. Oh, um, I enjoyed the play very much. You were awfully good. You are not here to talk about my performance. No, about Harry. Had you known him long? Yes. But there's nothing really to say, is there? Nothing. Well, I saw you at the funeral. I am so sorry. I didn't notice much. You were in love with him, weren't you? I don't know. How can you know a thing like that afterwards? I don't know anything anymore, except that I want to be dead too. I, I was talking to another friend of Harry's, a Baron Kurtz. Do you know him? That was the man who brought me some money when Harry died. He said Harry had been anxious at the last moment. He said he'd remembered me, too. Seems to show he wasn't in much pain. Dr. Winkert told me that he was passing just as it happened. Harry's own doctor? Yes. They said it wasn't the driver's fault. Harry often said what a careful driver he was. The man in the truck was Harry's driver? I don't get it. All of them there. Kurtz, this Romanian, Popescu, his own driver knocking him over, his own doctor passing by. No strangers there at all. I know. I've wondered about it a hundred times, if it really was an accident. What difference does it make? He's dead. Well, if it wasn't an accident... I'm sorry. I can't stay here. They don't like us to use the light. Would you come with me? Where? To Harry's apartment. At this hour? The porter saw it happen. Then why worry? Do you know that porter? Yes. All right, Mr. Martins. We will speak to the porter. We speak inside Mr. Lime's apartment. Sehen Sie der gleich da unter. Da unter ist passiert. Ah, 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 passiert. Ah, ah, ah. What's he saying? Come over to the window. He says it happened right down there. Happened, yes. Happened right down there. You saw it? Not saw. Heard. Heard. I heard the brakes. Wham! Then I saw them carry the body to the other side of the Emperor Yosef statue. Why didn't they bring him in the house? Could he have been conscious? Conscious? Wie soll ich das wissen? Oh, uh, was he... was he still alive? Er, uh, alive? He could not have been alive. Not with his head in the way it was. But how could he have talked about me? And this lady here, after he was dead? Why didn't you say all this at the inquest? It is better not to be mixed up in things like this. I was not the only one who did not give evidence. Who else? Three men helped to carry your friend to the statue. Kurtz. Yes. The Romanian. Popescu. Yes. Who else? You mean that doctor? There was a third man. He came later after they carried him to the Yosa statue. What did he look like? I did not see his face. He might have been just anybody. Just anybody. I was told there were only two men there. 
You've got to tell your story to the police. Police? Why police? Nein, nein. Es war nichts anderes als ein Unfall. It is all nonsense. It was an accident. You don't know it was an accident. You only saw a dead man and three men carry him. I should have listened to my wife. She said you were up to no good. Gossip. Suppose I take your evidence to the police. I have no evidence. It is not my business. Well, make it your business. Fräulein, Fräulein Schmidt, I have always liked you, but you must not bring this gentleman here again. You must go at once, please. We had better leave, Mr. Martins. Oh, can I take you home? It does not matter if you want to. In the entryway of her small apartment building, Anna paused before climbing the stairs. I have been sinking. Leave Vienna, Mr. Martins. Go home. <laughs> You're not the first person who's told me that. There is nothing you can do here. Well, if I do find out something, may I look you up again? Oh, uh, you know where I work, where I live. What could I... Fräulein Schmidt! Wir sind unglaublich wegen des Stecken. Die Polizei ist oben. Sie warten für Ihre Papiere suchen. Lesen Sie Ihre Briefe. Als warten Sie ein Verbrecher. What's she talking about? The police. They're upstairs searching my room. Was er sich handelt? Mein Gott, das ist doch schrecklich. <laughs> Sergeant Payne, Major Calloway? Getting around, Martins. What the devil? Pinning things on girls now? Miss Schmidt, I should like to see your papers, please. Don't give him anything. Here, my passport. Thank you. You were born in Graz. Have Austrian parents? Yes. How much did you pay for this? I'm afraid we'll have to keep this for a while, Miss Schmidt. How do you expect her to live in this city without papers? Write her out a receipt, Payne. Give her a receipt for these letters, too. Yes, sir. I suppose it wouldn't interest you to know that Lyme was murder. You're too busy. You haven't even bothered to get complete evidence. My letters. Must you take those? They'll be returned, miss. They are private letters. That's all right, miss. Don't worry. We're used to it, like doctors. There was a third man there. I suppose that doesn't sound peculiar to you. I'm not interested in whether a racketeer like Lyme was killed by his friends or by accident. The only important thing is that he's dead. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Schmidt. Tactful, too, aren't we, Callahan? Callaway. Must you take those letters? I'm afraid so. They're Harry's. That's the reason. You won't learn anything from them. They're only love letters. There are not many of them. They'll be returned to you, Miss Schmidt. As soon as they've been examined. There's nothing in them. Harry never did anything. Only a small thing once out of kindness. And what was that? My passport. You've got it in your hand. You will have to come with us, Miss Schmidt. You're not locking her up. Go home, Martins, like a sensible chap. You don't know what you're mixing in. Get the next plane. As soon as I get to the bottom of this, I'll get the next plane. Death is at the bottom of everything, Martins. Leave death to the professionals. You mind if I use that line in my next Western? You can't chuck me out. My papers are in order. Look, is there anything really wrong with your papers? They're forged. Why? The Russians would claim me. I come from Czechoslovakia. Miss Schmidt, ready? Good night, Martins. <laughs> He stood out on the sidewalk as they drove off. After a moment by myself, I remembered the doctor. Dr. Winkle. I got his address from a telephone directory and then hailed a taxi. Dr. Winkle, my name is Martins. Holly Martins. Uh, Winkle, Winkle, what can I do for you, Mr. Martins? I realize this is no time for nightly calling, doctor, but, well, 
We were both friends of Harry Lyme, and, and I... Uh, I was his medical advisor, yes. I want to find out all I can. Find out? Hear the details. I can tell you very little. He was run over by a truck. He was dead when I arrived. Who was with him? Uh, two of his friends. Two? Are you sure? Quite sure. Could he have been at all conscious? I understand he was, yes, for a short time, while they carried him across the road. I was not there. My opinion is limited as to the cause of death. Uh, have you any reason to be dissatisfied? Was it possible that his death might have been not accidental? Could he have been, could he have been pushed, Dr. Winkle? Uh, Winkle, Winkle, I cannot give an opinion. The injuries to head and skull would have been the same. And now I am afraid I must... Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Sergeant, come in, come in. I followed Martin, sir. He went to Dr. Winkle's home, then he came back here. Yeah? He's down the street, sir, waiting for Miss Schmidt, I'd imagine. Yes, she's in the other office. Bring her in. Oh, I, uh, should have forged passport to the French, the Americans and the Russians. Yes, sir? Our Russian friend, Captain Brodsky, is very interested. He wants us to hold it until he can talk to Colonel Polikoff. Well, uh, bring her in, Sergeant. My papers. But you have not returned everything, have you? We will need your passport for a while longer. Miss Schmidt... You were intimate with Lyme, weren't you? We loved each other. Do you mean that? Would you look at this photograph, please? Do you know this man? I've never seen him. Joseph Harbin? No. He works in a military hospital? No. It's stupid to lie to me, Miss Schmidt. I'm in a position to help you. I'm not lying. You're wrong about Harry. You're wrong about everything. In one of his letters, Harry Lyme asked you to telephone a good friend of his, called Joseph. He gave you the number of the Casanova Club. That is where a lot of Lyme's friends used to go. What was the message? It wasn't important. Something about meeting Harry at his home. Harbin disappeared the day you telephoned. We've got to find him. You can help us. What can I tell you but that you have got everything upside down? Am I under arrest? No. No. We will send for you when we want you. Oh, uh, your American friend is still waiting for you out there. He won't do you much good, Miss Schmidt. No? No. Good night, Miss Schmidt. In just a few moments, we'll continue with Act Two of The Third Man. Now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter, with the Lux Movie News of the Week. Our picture report tonight deals with a problem of intense human interest. In Follow the Sun, 20th Century Fox tells us how the great golfer, Ben Hogan, stages a comeback after a disabling accident. Glenn Ford plays Ben, and it's wonderful how he makes golf a thrilling game, even to a novice like me. Isn't it true, Libby, that Ben Hogan himself worked with Glenn throughout the filming? Yes, that's true, and Ann Baxter, as Ben's wife, got her interpretation from Mrs. Hogan. Ann is one of Hollywood's finest young actresses, and one of the loveliest. And she always has the fresh, radiant look about her because... <laughs> Because, John, she's a Lux girl. Anne depends on Lux soap for her complexion care and uses the new bath size, too. Says it makes her Lux beauty bath more luxurious than ever. So many stars tell us that, Libby, and no wonder. 
Even in the hardest water, with Lux, you get plenty of rich, creamy lather. And I love the way it leaves skin so fresh. Lux lovely all over. Lux soap, in the generous bath size, is made to please lovely women everywhere. Screen stars say they enjoy the delicate fragrance that a Lux soap bath leaves in their skin. Find out for yourself why 9 out of 10 screen stars use Lux toilet soap. Now, our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act 2 of The Third Man, starring Joseph Cotton as Holly Martins and Orson Welles as Harry Lyme. Anna saw me waiting under the street lamp in front of the government building. She would have gone on her way if I hadn't stopped her. I suggested a drink at the Casanova Club. Good evening. So you have found out my little secret, Mr. Martins, the Baron Kurtz, a violin player in a cheap cafe. A man must live. Good evening, Miss Schmidt. Good evening. You have proved to the police they are wrong, Mr. Martins? No, not yet. Mr. Popesco is here tonight. I thought he left Vienna. Uh, he is back now. I'll bring him to you. Haven't you done enough for tonight? The porter said three men carried the body, and two of them are here. You know, of course, Miss Schmidt, Mr. Popesco, Mr. Martins. How do you do? How do you do? Any friend of Harry's is a friend of mine. I'll leave you together. I understand you were with Harry. Oh, it was a terrible thing. I was just crossing the road to go to Harry. He and the Baron were on the sidewalk. If I hadn't started to cross the road, it wouldn't have happened. I can't help blaming myself and wishing things had been different. Anyway, he saw me and stepped off the sidewalk to meet me. And the truck. <gasps> it was terrible, Mr. Martins. Terrible. I have never seen a man killed before. I thought there was something funny about the whole thing. Funny? Something wrong. Of course there was. It was so terrible for a man like Harry to be killed in an ordinary street accident. That's all you meant? Well, what else? Who was the third man? What man are you referring to, Mr. Martins? I was told that a third man helped you and Kurtz to carry the body. I don't know how you could have heard that here. The finding of the body was in the police report. There were just the two of us, me and the Baron. Who could have told you a story like that? The porter at Harry's place. He was cleaning the window at the time. And saw the accident? No, no. He didn't see the accident, but he saw three men carrying the body. Wasn't he at the police inquiry? He didn't want to get involved. Ah, oh, well, we never teach these Austrians to be good citizens. It was his duty to give the evidence. Uh, even so, he remembered wrong. What else did he tell you? That Harry was dead before you got him to that statue. He probably knows a lot more than that. Somebody's lying, Mr. Popescu. Not necessarily. The police say Harry was mixed up in some racket. Oh, that's quite impossible. He had a great sense of duty. Yes, Miss Schmidt? I'm afraid I've not been listening. Is there anything else, Mr. Martins? No. No. Thanks for stopping by. It was my pleasure. Good night, Miss Schmidt. Good night. Oh, that's a nice girl, Mr. Martins. Oh, but she ought to go careful in Vienna. Everybody ought to go careful in a city like this. Good morning. Ach, what do you want of me now? Is it so very important for you? Yes, it is. I am not a bad man. I would like to tell you the things you want to know. Then how did a car, uh, a truck... Shh! Not now. Not here. My wife. Ach, if she thinks I tell you anything. Come tonight. My wife goes out. All right. I'll come back. But why... Shh! Tonight. 
You come here early tonight. Festa. That mean come in? Oh, yes. Yes, come in. Hope you don't mind. I have something to tell you. The porter is going to talk to us again tonight. <sighs> Must we go through it all again? I can manage by myself. You'll be at the theater, I suppose. No, we do three plays a week. I do not appear until Thursday. Then why don't you want to... Oh, bad day, huh? It is always bad about this time. Harry used to look in around six. I've been frightened at being alone, with, without friends and money. But I've never known anything like this. Please talk. Tell me about him. Tell you what? Oh, anything. Just talk. When did you see him last? Oh, we didn't make much sense. Drank too much. Once he tried to steal my girl. Where is she? Oh, that was 20 years ago. Tell me more. Um, it's very difficult. You know, Harry, we didn't do anything very amusing. He just made everything seem like such a fun. Was he clever when he was a boy? I suppose so. He could fix anything. He fixed my papers for me. He heard the Russians were repatriating people like me who came from Czechoslovakia. He knew the right person straight away for forging stamps. Yes. When he was 14, he taught me the three-card trick. Now that's growing up fast. He never grew up. The world grew up around him, that's all, and... <laughs> and buried him. <laughs> Oh, Anna, now, don't cry. You'll fall in love again. I do not want to. I do not ever want to. <clears throat> it's getting dark. If you are to see the porter again, we had better go. A moment ago, you said you didn't want to see the porter. They're both in it, Harry. Holly. Holly Martins, remember? I'm so sorry. It's all right. You might at least get the name right. I'm sorry. You know, you ought to find yourself a girl. Yeah, that's just what I keep telling myself. Here's the street, and isn't that Harry's building up the block? What's going on up ahead? It's a crowd of some sort. <gasps> They're gathered in front of Harry's. What does it mean? I can't be sure, but isn't that an ambulance at the curb? An accident. Another accident. Wait here. Let me see what it's all about. What's the matter? Was this loose? The porter is um gebraucht morden. I don't understand. The porter, dead, kaput, is murdered. The porter is tot, kaput. Porter, but I... Papa, Papa! Was willst du, Hansel? Papa, da is there, da is there. Ja, Papa, er der Mörder is. Anna, I don't need an interpreter to know what that boy said. He's pointing at me and the crowd is listening. Murder, murder. Air taught S. Papa, Papa, die stare. Murder, murder. Let's get out of here. Holly, Holly, wait. Stop. We don't need to run anymore. There's no one behind us. <sighs> they are afraid, like everyone in Vienna. Afraid? Afraid. Even of you. The porter was afraid too. Now he's dead. But the boy. Why did the boy say that you... I, I don't know why. 
the boy was here the other times I spoke to the porter. He, the, the boy, I, I thought he was teasing me, saying that the porter and I didn't like each other. What are you going to do? By now, they've told the police they will be looking for you. I'm not quite sure what I should do. Then be sensible. Tell Major Callaway. Callaway? Maybe you're right. And you? I will go with you. Who's being sensible now? You shouldn't be seen with me. Here, take a taxi and go home. But... No, and I guess I'd better not see you again. All right, Mr. Martins. Good night. So did go home, Martins. You're lucky to have gotten here alive. This isn't Santa Fe. I'm not a sheriff and you're not a cowboy. You have been blundering about Vienna with the worst bunch of racketeers in town. Your precious Harry's friends, and now you're wanted for murder. Put in drunk and disorderly, too. I have. Stop behaving like a fool, Martins. I'm only a little fool. I'm an amateur at it. You're the professional. You've been shaking your cap and bells all over town. Payne, get me the Harry Lime file and get Mr. Martins a large whiskey. I don't need your booze, Calloway. You will. I don't want another murder in this case, and you were born to be murdered. So you're going to hear the facts. Have you ever heard of penicillin? Well? In Vienna, there hasn't been enough penicillin to go round. So a nice trade started here, stealing penicillin from the hospitals, diluting it to make it go further and selling it to patients. Do you see what that means? Are you too busy chasing a few tubes of penicillin to investigate a murder? These were murders. Men with gangrenous legs, women in childbirth, and there were children, too. They used some of this diluted penicillin against meningitis. The lucky children died. The unlucky ones went off their heads. You can see them now in the mental wards. That is the racket Harry Lime organized. Calloway, you haven't shown me one shred of evidence. We're just coming to that. Payne, the Lime file, please. Very good, sir. You know, Martins... Payne's one of your most devoted readers. He's promised to lend me one of your books. Which one is it, Payne? The uh, Lone Rider of Santa Fe, sir. That's right. The Lone Rider of Santa Fe. I'd like to visit Texas one day, sir. Come on. Show me what you've got to show. You see this photo here? A man called Harbin. Medical orderly at the General Hospital. He worked for Lyme and helped to steal the stuff from the laboratories. We forced him to give us information, which led us as far as Kurtz and Lyme. But we didn't arrest them, as our evidence wasn't complete and it might have spoiled our chances of getting the others. I'd like a word with this orderly, Harbin. So would I. Bring him in. I can't. He disappeared four days ago. Now let's take a look at Baron Kurtz. We know for a fact that Lyme met Kurtz a little over a year ago. Well, now you know the facts, Mr. Martins. Frankly, they turn my stomach. How could he have done it? How could... How could Harry have done it? Seventy pounds for a tube of penicillin. Go back to the hotel. And do keep out of trouble. I'll try and fix things with the Austrian police. You'll be all right in the hotel, but I can't be responsible for you in the streets. I'm not asking you to. I'm sorry, Martins. I'm sorry, too. You still got that airplane ticket on you? We'll send one across to your hotel in the morning. Thank you. This time, I'm going to use it. Come in. Thank you. I thought you were going to see Major Calloway. Aren't the police after you? I don't know. You're drunk, aren't you? A bit. Sorry. But I did want to say goodbye before I pushed off. I'm going back home. Why? It's what you've always wanted. All of you. Cat? I didn't know you had a cat. Kitty, 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 kitty. Don't you want to play, Kitty? No. He only likes Harry. What made you decide so suddenly, as Calloway told you? Told me? About Harry. You know. I've seen Major Calloway today. He's better. Dead. 
I knew he was mixed up, but not like that. I knew him for 10, 20 years. At least I thought I knew him. I suppose he was laughing at fools like us all the time. He liked to laugh. 70 pounds a tube. He wanted me to write for his great medical charity. Perhaps I could have raised the price to 80 pounds for it. Oh, please, for heaven's sake, stop making him in your own image. Harry was real. He wasn't just your friend and my lover. He was Harry. Well, don't preach wisdom to me. You talk about him as if he had occasional bad manners. I know, I'm just a hack writer who drinks too much and falls in love with girls. You. Me. Don't be such a fool. Of course. If you'd rung me up and asked me if you were fair or dark or had a moustache, I wouldn't have known. I'm leaving Vienna. I don't care whether Harry was murdered by Kurtz or Popescu or a third man. Whoever killed him, there was some sort of justice. Maybe I'd have killed him myself. A person doesn't change just because you find out more about him. Look, I've got a splitting headache and you just stand there and just talk and talk and talk. I hate it. <laughs> you hate it. First time I ever saw you laugh. Do it again. There isn't enough for two laughs. If I make comic faces and stand on my head and grin at you between my legs and tell all sorts of jokes, I wouldn't stand a chance, would I? All right. You did tell me I had to find myself a girl. <laughs> It was dark in the street, deserted. The large empty square with the black buildings looming up around it, not a sound, except... Kitty? You're kitty, 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 kitty. Suddenly I saw a pair of black shoes across the square. The cat was beside them, biting the shoelaces. The rest of the man wearing them was in the shadow of a doorway. I yelled across the square at the stranger, calling him a spy, asking him who did he think he was following me. And then the moon broke through the clouds and I saw his face. Harry! 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 You say this is the spot? Yes. I followed his shadow until suddenly... Well? This is where he just vanished. And I suppose you don't believe me. No. Look, you don't think I'm blind, do you? Yes. Where were you when you saw him last? Fifty yards right down there. Which side of the road? I was on that side, the shadow was on that side, and no turnings on either side. How about the doorway? I tell you, I heard him running ahead of me. Yes, 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 and then he vanished out there, I suppose, with a puff of smoke and a clap of... Hello. It wasn't the gin after all. What's this? Where are we? It's a kiosk, sir. Inside are the steps that lead to the main sewer, which runs right into the blue Danube. It smells sweet, doesn't it? We should have dug deeper than a grave. Because, Martins, if you saw Lyme tonight, Someone else is buried in that cemetery. Major, cemetery official says the coffin's up. Are you...? Yes, Sergeant. Mr. Martins and I will both have a look. Hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yes, yes. Joseph Harbin, the medical orderly I told you about, smuggled the penicillin for Lyme. Joseph Harbin? But you said he was missing. Next time, we'll have a foolproof coffin.
Well, I suppose the least I can do is apologize, Martins. Obviously, you did see Lime. Thanks. I'll, uh, drop you off at the hotel, and then I'll... If you don't mind, you can drop me off at Anna Schmidt's apartment. You'll not find her there. Oh, really? Why not? Because by now, she's been arrested. Why? What for? A forged passport. She's wanted by the Russian police. She should be at my office by now. Then I'll see her there. No, Mr. Martins, you cannot see her there. Well, if you'll just step into the Major's office, Miss Schmidt. Sorry to bring you back here at this hour, Miss Schmidt. You're arresting me because of the passport. Is that it? I'm not interested in your forged papers. That's purely a Russian case. When did you last see Lime? Two weeks ago. I want the truth, Miss Schmidt. We know he's alive. What did you say? I'm sorry. I said another man's buried in his place. Where's Harry? That's what we want to find out. I'm sorry. I don't seem to understand anything you say. He's alive now, this minute? He's doing something? Miss Schmidt, we know he is somewhere across the canal in the Russian sector. You may as well help us. In a few minutes, Captain Brodsky will be questioning you about your papers. Tell me where Lime is. I don't know. If you help me, I am prepared to help you. Martin's always said you were a fool. Vienna is a closed city, Miss Schmidt. He can't get away. Poor Harry. I wish he was dead. He would be safe then from all of you. (sighs) All right, Miss Schmidt. I'm afraid I have no alternative. Sergeant, take her to Brodsky. We'll bring you Act 3 of The Third Man. I've chosen as our guest tonight an actress who plays a most unusual role in a most unusual picture. Gypsy Blood, produced by David O. Selznick and Alexander Korda. Miss Irene Winston. Irene, I understand your part is uh, heard but not seen? Yes, Mr. Keeley. I play a voice. The voice of a mother speaking to a daughter through a gypsy charm book. Jennifer Jones is the star, you know, a lovely, wild, half-gypsy girl. When she wants guidance, she consults her book, and that's when I speak. Hmm, Gypsy Blood was filmed abroad, wasn't it? Yes, except for my part, filmed right here in Hollywood. I wish I could have gone to Wales and to Shropshire, England, where the outdoor shots were made. They're magnificent! You know, I'd say this wild, romantic countryside is the right background for this fantastic tale. And Jennifer Jones is so right for the part of a gypsy maid with her dark, striking beauty. She never has to use makeup, you know, with that fabulous complexion. Speaking of charm books, Irene, I'm sure there's a page in yours on Lux toilet soap. I should say so, Mr. Kennedy. The very first page. Like the screen stars, I wouldn't trust my skin to any other soap. Is that how you stay so... Lux lovely, Irene? It sure is, Mr. Kennedy. Lux soap facials are such a grand complexion care. My face is always so soft and smooth. Thank you, Miss Irene Winston, for telling us about Hollywood's own complexion care. Discover for yourself why nine out of ten screen stars depend upon fragrant white Lux toilet soap. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS the Columbia Broadcasting System. The curtain rises on Act Three of The Third Man, starring Joseph Cotton as Holly Martins and Orson Welles as Harry Lyme. I called on Dr. Winkle early the next morning. I told him I wanted to talk to Harry Lyme. Harry Lyme? Mr. Martins, are you mad? All right, I'm mad. 
I have seen a ghost. You tell Harry I want to see him. Today. This afternoon. Be reasonable. How can you stand there and say? I saw Harry last night. Now I passed a park a few blocks from here, an amusement park. You tell him I'll meet him there. You or Kurtz can arrange it. You take a great deal for granted, Mr. Martins. Do I? Tell Harry I'll wait by the Ferris wheel there. Or do ghosts only ride by night, Winkle? Got an opinion about that? He was there at the amusement park at three o'clock. Harry Lyme, striding down the midway, a broad smile on his face, immaculate and chipper as always. Polly, hello, old man. How are you? Hello, Harry. Well, well, they seem to have been giving you quite some busy time. Listen. Yes. I want to talk to you. Talk to me? Of course. Let's get on the Ferris wheel. Ferris wheel? Look around. Business must be bad. Not a soul to get in our way. We'll have it all to ourselves for our little talk. Or does it make you dizzy way up there? Come on. We're wasting time. <laughs> Up we go, Holly. Interesting, isn't it? We're in a wooden box instead of on the swinging bench we're used to in America. Kids used to ride this thing a lot in the old days. They haven't got the money nowadays, poor little devils. It's good to see you, old man. I was at your funeral. It was pretty smart, wasn't it? <clears throat> oh, the same old indigestion, Holly. These tablets, they're the only things that help. <clears throat> These are the last of them. Can't get them anywhere in Europe anymore. You know what's happened to your girl? She's been arrested. Tough, tough. Don't worry, old man. They won't hurt her. They're handing her over to the Russians. What can I do, old man? I'm dead, aren't I? <laughs> Holly, exactly who did you tell about me, hmm? I told the police. Unwise, Holly. And Anna. Did the police believe you? You don't care anything at all about Anna, do you? Well, I've got quite a lot on my mind. You wouldn't do anything? What do you want me to do? Give myself up? Why not? <laughs> Tis a far, far better thing that I do. <sighs> Holly, you and I aren't heroes. The world doesn't make any heroes outside of your stories. I've got to be careful. I'm safe only in the Russian sector. Safe only as long as they can use me. As long as they can use you. <clears throat> I wish I could get rid of this thing. So that's how they found out about Anna. You told them, didn't you? Don't try to be a policeman, old man. What did you expect me to be? Part of your... Part? You can have any part you want, so long as you don't interfere. I have never cut you out of anything yet. I remember when they raided the gambling joint. You knew a safe way out. Sure. Yes. Safe for you, not safe for me. Old man, you never should have gone to the police. You know you ought to leave this thing alone. Have you ever seen any of your victims? Victims? Don't be melodramatic. Look down there, all of those human beings. Don't they look like dots? Would you feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped moving, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spare? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax. It's the only way to save money nowadays. A lot of good your money would do you in jail. The jail is in another zone. There's no proof against me, besides you. I should be pretty easy to get rid of. Pretty easy. I wouldn't be too sure. I carry a gun. I don't think they'd look for a bullet wound after you'd hit that ground. Not from this height. They've dug up your coffin. And found Harbin. Hmm. Pity. Oh, Holly. What fools we are talking to each other this way. As though I would do anything to you, or you to me. You're just a little mixed up about things in general. Nobody thinks in terms of human beings. Governments don't, so why should we? They talk about the people and the proletariat. I talk about the suckers and the mugs. It's the same thing. They have their five-year plans, and so do I. You used to believe in God. I still do believe in God, old man. And mercy and all that. The dead are happier dead. They don't miss much here, poor devils. What do you believe in? 
Well, if you ever get Anna out of this mess, be kind to her. You'll find she's worth it. I wish I'd asked you to bring me some of these tablets from home. <clears throat> hmm. It looks like a little journey into the ozone is over. Holly, I would like to cut you in, old man. Nobody left in Vienna I can really trust, and we have always done everything together. When you make up your mind, send me a message through Kurtz. I'll meet you any place, any time. And when we do meet, old man, it's you I want to see, not the police. Remember that, won't you? <laughs> Don't be so gloomy. After all, it's not that awful. Remember what the fellow said. In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed. But they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had 500 years of peace and democracy. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. So long, Holly. <laughs> Look here, Martins. You can always arrange to meet Lime at some cafe here in the International Zone. It wouldn't work. We'll never get him in the Russian Zone. Callaway, you expect too much. I know he deserves to hang. You've proved your stuff. Don't ask me to tie the rope. <sighs> okay, forget it. Busy, Major? What is it, Captain Brodsky? We have identified the girl. Anna Schmidt? Here is her report. I've questioned her. We have nothing against her. But we have. We shall apply for her at the four power meeting tomorrow. She has no right to be here. I've made an application too. I've asked your people to help with Lyme. That is a different case. It is being looked into. Good day, Major. <sighs> That's the sort of thing we're up against, Martins. I think we would have captured Lyme. With your help. What price would you pay? Name it. There's a train at the platform, miss. If there's anything else I can do. I do not understand Major Calloway, Sergeant. Why has he done this? Helping me to run away. I expect he has a soft spot for you, miss. You're well out of things now. Good luck, miss. Thank you. Train leaves in two minutes. Holly, what are you doing here? I wanted to see you all. How did you know I would be here? Have you been seeing Major Calloway again? Of course not. I don't live in his pocket. Now, Anna, I want you to send me a wire as soon as you arrive. There's Harry. He's safe in the Russian zone. I saw him today. How is he? He can look after himself. Don't you worry. Did he say anything about me? Tell me. Oh, the usual things. No. There is something wrong. Did you tell Calloway about meeting Harry? Of course I didn't tell Calloway. Why should he help me like that? The Russians would only make trouble for him. That's Calloway's headache. Why are you lying to me? We're getting you out of here, aren't we? No! I will not go! You have seen Calloway. What are you two doing? Well, well, they asked me to help take him, and I'm helping. <laughs> Oh, Harry. Poor Harry. Poor Harry wouldn't even lift a finger to help you. Oh, you got your precious honesty and don't want anything else. You still want him? I don't want him anymore. I don't want to see him or hear him. But he is still a part of me. I can't do a thing to hurt him. Anna, get, get on the train. No! No, I would not do it. Why do we always have to quarrel? If you want to sell your services, I am not willing to be the price. I loved him. You loved him. What good have we done him? Look at yourself. They have names for faces like yours. Anna 
Savannah didn't get on the train. I left the railway station and went to see Callaway. Martins! Ah, there you are. I meant to tell you, Payne lent me one of your books. The Oklahoma Kid, I think it was. Read a bit of it, and I think it's pretty good. What made you take up this sort of thing? Been doing it for long. All right, Callaway. You win. I never knew there were snake charmers in Texas. I said you win. Win what? I'll be your damn decoy duck. The plan was simple. Through Kurtz, I got word to Harry that I wanted to see him. Six o'clock at the Cafe Aurora. Callaway picked the spot. At five minutes to six, I sat down at a table on the corner, my eyes glued on the entrance, looking for Harry. I didn't even see her walk up. He will not come. Not Harry. Anna, how did you know I was here? From Kurtz. He and Papasco have just been arrested. But Harry won't come. He's not a fool. So what is your price this time? You can't tell me you're doing all this for nothing. No, no price, Anna. Now please, go away. Honest, sensible, sober, harmless Holly Martins. Holly, what a silly name. You must be very proud to be a police informer. To be able to... Anna stopped talking, just stood there, looking across the cafe. In the doorway was Harry Lime. Harry, get away! The police are waiting for you! Run! Run! Harry pulled a gun and fired once, and I saw Sergeant Payne fall. But Harry never stopped moving. He sped through the cafe into the kitchen, and he was gone. I ran over to Payne, who was wounded but not in danger, snatched up his pistol, and ran after Harry. Out in the street, I saw police closing in from all sides. One group of them was running toward a kiosk, one of the little buildings that cover the entrance to the city sewer. Among the group, I recognized Major Calloway, and I followed close behind. Martins, get back! Don't be a fool! I've got a gun. Sergeant Payne's gun. Where can Harry get to? To the Russian zone. Only he'll never make it. We've got men closing in from both directions. They'll kill him! That is up. That is up to Mr. Lime. Get out of here. Wait at my office if you like. Just get out of here. Back on the street, I found a taxi at the corner and gave Anna's address. But it was the sewer I was thinking of. The sewer and the kiosk in the square across from Anna's house. I climbed down the iron ladder and waited. Far off, I could hear the shouts of the police. Some yards below, I could hear, as I clung to the damp wall, the sluggish churning of the water. Then, a different sound. Harry, stay where you are, Harry. Yes. tägliches Brot. Gib uns heute und vergib uns unsere Schuld, wie auch wir vergeben unseren Schuldgern. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung, sondern erlöse uns von dem Bösen. Denn dein ist das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. 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 And this was where I came in. The cemetery, the freshly dug grave, the priest reciting, Calloway, and Anna. Once it was all over, Anna turned without a word and started down the long road between the trees. What time is it? No, um, half past two. Get in the jeep. I'll have to step on it if we're going to catch that plane. Calloway, can't you do something about Anna? I'll do what I can, if she'll let me. 
She's so alone. Perhaps I can... Wait a minute. Let me out. Well, there's not much time. I can't just leave. Please. Be sensible, Malthus. I haven't got a sensible name, Calloway. We had passed her on the road. I leaned against the fender of the jeep and waited. What would I say to her? What could I tell her? There wasn't time to think. She was in front of me now. Anna? But Anna Schmidt did not turn her head, not even a glance. She just kept walking down the road. Tonight's presentation of the Lux Radio Theater was The Third Man, originally produced for the screen by David Oselznik and directed by Carol Reed. The Zither theme music was composed and performed by Anton Karras. We thank our stars Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles, and special guests Libby Collins and Irene Winston. Your producer was William Keeley, and your announcer was John Milton Kennedy. Be sure to listen next Monday night to Lux Radio Theater presentation of Johnny O'Clock with Dick Powell, Evelyn Keyes, and Lee Cobb. And why not tune in to Joan Davis every Monday night over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You have been listening to a remake of The Third Man, an entry in the Sonic Society's Summer Stock Series, presented by the Narada Radio Company. Featured in the cast, Alan Clower as Holly Martins, Pete Lutz as Harry Lime, Jason D. Johnson as Major Calloway, Leanne King as Anna Schmidt, Dana Gonzalez as Sergeant Payne, Nick Womack as Baron Kurtz, Tamara Merson Wren as the Porter's Wife, Kevin Schuster as the hotel clerk, Mary Lee Robinson as the landlady, John Valadez as Dr. Winkel, Jordan Brewster as Mr. Popesco, Christian Ferris as the Viennese bystander, Skeeter Ullman as the boy's father, Carl Yal as Captain Brodsky, Dana Gonzalez as the priest, with Christian Ferris as producer William Keeley, Darren Ruiz as Libby Collins, Hollywood reporter, and Kendra Womack is Irene Winston, actress. The role of the porter was played by Eric Lutz. The role of the boy by Bailey Roberts. The CBS announcer, John Milton Kennedy, was portrayed by Larry Hutchison. And I'm Lisa Ayala. The Third Man was originally broadcast over the CBS radio network on April 9, 1951, as part of the Lux Radio Theater series. It was adapted from the 1949 film of the same name. This remake, starring the Narada Radio Company, was adapted, produced, and directed for the Sonic Society Summer Stock Series by Pete Lutz. It is presented as a tribute to the original, for entertainment purposes only, and no infringement is intended. Thanks for listening, and we hope you will enjoy the other programs in the Sonic Society's Summer Stock Series. And that's this week's performance for Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. All productions, performances, characters and scripts presented in the Playhouse belong strictly to their copyright holders and no copyright infringement is assumed or intended. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is part of the Sonic Society podcast and Electric by Kuna Productions. Any shows that continue their run must have explicit permission from all parties involved. Join us next week at the Playhouse for another classic performance. I am your announcer... David Alt.
Good night. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.